We can cover some ground pretty quick. Well, and you know, so I got some things I want to talk about. Sure. But, you know, it's like I, I, I really want to make sure everybody's happy and discussing what they want to talk about. But there's only two of us. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> topic is uh, building a communities, right? Yep. So, uh, building communities. Okay. So you were you were in the middle of talking about Wayne State and Wayne you know, State, and uh, they've been trying to build a tech community there. We actually got some suggestions. There's a uh, it's a Linux users group, so it has a it's real narrow topics per se. It's just going to be the Linux users, but there are a huge number of them at Wayne State. Yeah. Um, they've just not been able to build a community. There's the Washtenaw Linux users group. They got regular meetings and they're doing pretty well. And I have not been there, but I've been told the Oakland County users group has very large meetings with very big turnouts. Um, they even had a presentation. Part of it, too, they get some really good presenters. I believe they had some people from Facebook. And one of the guys was an engineer there, and his topic that he brought was how does Facebook deliver uh, services to 1.2 billion people? How does that scale? How does that work? So, I mean, you guys, that's going to draw attention because you got a speaker going, that's something I want to know about. How do they put, how do you scale something to the 1.2 billion user? No one ever scaled a website that big before, you know? It was like, it's so there's some cool things to talk about. Um, Walsh College sponsors what they call the Walsh College uh, Open Source Group, but it's not specifically Linux, it's just called Open Source Group. They draw a lot of speakers. Um, when I spoke at that, there were, I think, uh, 47 people showed up. So they've got a regular, and that's, they've had attendees even higher on some of their topics. Um, they had, I know they had a lot of people sign up for their WordPress and the WordPress one drew a lot of people. It was basically how do I set up a WordPress site. So it was a topic that a lot of people, even small business owners that just say or just startups, funny. I kind of want to do things myself on a website. So you know that topic was engaging to them. Uh, I've done topics on Google and topics on security and protecting yourself online. Uh, those I've gotten. I did that with Down River in my community area uh, through a sponsorship with uh, the Chamber of Commerce. That drew a lot of people. That drew about 50 uh, businesses, and that was my target audience. Was whether you're a one-man band or you're a larger company, no problem. I've also done some talks uh, working with the Henry Ford Group and teaching older people technology, and that's actually got that's actually done really well. I'm really shocked how tech savvy a lot of the older community is. Well, so it's like they're like kids, like they, they have all the time in the world to learn this stuff. And yeah, yeah. that nine to five thing. And they're realizing too that this is the gateway to connecting with. All their friends, their all their interests, yeah. Yeah, and their interests and things like that. Uh, you have World War II veterans that are just fascinated the fact that there's entire pages with pictures. And they're like, there's my work buddy from there. Because he lose track of him. You didn't know what happened after this. Yeah. You know, we, I got a gentleman he's in his 80s, you know, World War II veteran, paratrooper. Just had an extensive career in the military. And now he found all these buddies that yeah. he didn't you know, lost track of and or found some history on. So there's, you know, you see the older community. Uh, finding engaging topics can be a little bit tough sometimes, I think, but once you find it and you can get the word out to the people, there's an interest. But in my actual down river community, finding general people, general users, no, I have not found much of an audience there. Businesses, at least, because they have, you know, if you pick a business topic, like that can market to the businesses, to the Chamber of Commerce or other business associations, you can get their attention. Finding, building a community of text for general users becomes really difficult. Uh, well, because everything's available online, why would you go out to a physical meeting if you could sit at right. home? And I think you understand the value of things like uh, Penguin Con would be a great example. I love, you know, the reason I was up to a forum where you had nothing to drink or anything was we had a really deep discussion about uh, Android development and iPhone development and app development for phones with a group of people, a couple of them were programmers and writers. And, you know, we just sat down and talked to you, so, you know, you've just spent two hours discussing a lot of details on how the architecture we change, how we can do an open source phone, how we can get what the Ubuntu phone's like, and, you know, how the app space works on that. And, you know, you get into those really details and you just lose time, but that's great. That's, you know, that fosters further discussion and things like that. So you can find, you know, text if you find the right ones. Yeah. But the other side of the coin is a lot of those techie people are super introverted, mm -hmm. and they're... They're hard to get out of the house. Yeah, yeah. I know so, a couple guys like that. Yeah, they're. You know, I have a few friends that are brilliant programmers, and they're very articulate online. They can type really well, and they'll chat with you all day. They're very responsive, and I'll give 
you wouldn't think of them as an introvert reading it, but when they get in person, they're just, they don't want to speak. Yeah. You know, or they, they get this social anxiety from being around too many people, so they're like, ah. Right, so I wonder if there's some psychology we can, you know, somehow say, okay, I'll, you know, I'll be the front man and things like that and try to protect them and give them a safe environment to do some, some you know. Well, once you get them, to. and I've had a lot of them, once you get them, they, they uh, there's, a, I don't know if it's a genetic thing, <laughs> They don't want to just, they can't do small talk is what I've really noticed. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, my, my friend Jason is brilliant, one of the uh, smartest people I know, but he can't do small. I, I don't know that he honestly could tell me who's president or vice president, and I know he doesn't care. I, I'm yeah. well aware of that. Yeah. It's completely not a concern in his life. He's a brilliant IT, works for the state of Michigan. Um, if I have any obscure Microsoft thing, the guy is just amazing at finding or fixing any weird problems, and this is what he does all day. But his conversations are very focused. You want to talk about Microsoft servers? You can't stop him. You want to talk about any of the topics? He builds a lot of maker stuff and um, rewires things. He rewired uh, the entire light array that he built around his desk. His desk is all this custom made stuff, and he rewires RAID array to blink lights across the top of his desk and things like that. If you would ask him, like I said, politics, no talk. Talk about that. Twenty minutes of every little detail, every wire, how he had to solder, how you can get the digital board that does the processing to pull this over here. And then he cut out on his server. He put um, they're not Arduinos, but they're like them. I can't remember what they are. Uh, he found them. There's something obscure, and he was upset. They came from China, but they didn't have the right programming language with them or any demo programs. So he wrote all the demo programs, contacted the company, and gave them all to them. Said, look, when you ship these products, you'll sell so much better if you have all these demo programs. Mm -hmm. And it's basically an LCD with an uh, interface package so you can read uh, things from the computer and redisplay them on this LCD, yeah. anything you want. And he, they did the most rudimentary app. He extended the app, he wrote this, wrote all the demo programs for it, and shipped it back to them just here. Take it, and they sent him like a couple free ones. Was, I didn't even ask for them, but he goes, yeah. I just thought it was, they should have this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but you can get them to talk about that all day. But So sometimes you can find them and uh, let them discuss their topic. And, and they make great people to bring something because they put, they're so dedicated and focused on a single uh, topic, you know, whether it's an Arduino project or something right. like so that. Right, so um, Raspberry Pi buff, and the guy brought his little remote control device called a robot, and you know, it was, you know, centered around that for a while. It's like, yeah, I can see how a thing kind of attracts attention. There's a, a guy in the middle on the first day of the opening ceremonies, and he had built a, uh, I was talking about last night, a main box um, out of Raspberry Pi. And they had all the games on there, the emulators, he's got just thousands of games on there. And he just really nice job of assembling, put it together. It was a fairly advanced build to build it, but you know, he, I, I've met that guy before, and I want to say I went to high school, so I forgot to ask that, because I remember being super quiet in air time, so he doesn't talk, but it, you know, he's just sitting there playing it, and you would say hi, and you might not notice, but if you say, what do you got? Oh, <laughs> I have this, and this is all that went in the building. And let me, and he breaks part of it down, takes the back plate off. Here's how you do this, and here's, you know, you can find them. But they also, for, to me or to a lot of the general public who are other techies that want to build it, you know, it goes real fascinating. I guess it depends on too on what your audience is. If you're looking for the general public, they're not as interested. You look for other enthusiast groups who want to get into it or hobbyists. Well, right. So I think there's a broad spectrum of, of people and things that cover, you know, we do these seniors, how to use Facebook, that's one of the things we're doing. We're doing that, that would, yeah. how to protect yourself on the internet, you know, that type of thing. Um, and I don't have anything really other than that that's been, you know, set up as a, as a definite. And I got, you know, a couple of interesting things that are maybes and, you know, it's kind of somewhat committed to me, that type of thing. Yeah, it is, like I said, it's a little tough trying to do. So we've been trying to do I would love to find more tech enthusiasts, but I'm really realizing down the river where I live is just, yeah. there's a lack of them. You can find car enthusiasts all day. I can find, if I, well, you know, I can talk about that too. But yeah, yeah, you find, because you got all the rednecks that live by me and stuff, so it's like, you know, I live in like a technology vacuum, I think, sometimes. Yeah. Well, so we've got a group in, in Dearborn, uh, okay. MD Lug. MD oh, okay, yeah. And then there's Mug. And they need up, you know, a little further north here. Um, Mr. What was the guy at the Mug? Jim McClellan. Um, the other. Okay, he's here too. Uh, they have. They want me to. Yeah. yeah, they want me to speak at the Mug. Yeah. I was, well, I want you to speak at MD Mug too. Okay, I'm for that. <laughs> I'm all for. I, I 
I love doing it. I'll yeah. do all kinds of presentations. President at mdlove.org. Okay. Go to our mdlove.org and sign up for our web. Our, you know, Let's do it. Oh, we have a list here, so I never get an email list. But yeah, Mug is a good, you know, a bigger organization. They have maybe 30 people show up in a lot of their meetings. That's great. We're a much smaller group. I can't get, you know, it's hard to get 10 people to show up. But, uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it, it, it's deep, you try. Uh, do I go, what is it, mdlove.org? mdlug.org. Like I said, there's a broad spectrum of stuff. We're doing this thing with the Henry Ford Centennial Library in Dearborn, the Dearborn Main Library, uh, trying to get speakers and workshops and stuff like that. So the idea is we get to use the facilities for free, but we've got to bring workshops in. You know, so we have to, every once in a while, we're going to have to you know, put something together for the, the general public. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have, um, how about the subject? I would like to do a talk. Um, I bet you saw me at the tech uh, building tech community thing. I, sorry, I didn't catch your name. So. Oh, Tom Lawrence. Tom Lawrence. Okay, I'm Gibson Nichols. Oh, thank you. Uh, was it Gibson? Gibson Nichols. Gibson Nichols, all right. I just put an email, I think, you know, as we talk about the video and the phone number in there. Yeah, there are more people I thought about this. Yeah. <laughs> Well, cool. So, you know, we have tons of ideas and topics and stuff like that that sound interesting. It's just a matter of really getting people to say they're, they'll step forward and, and do that. There's just so much, you know, ideas and stuff. You know, taking like uh, seniors or taking the general public and, you know, introduction to computer. This is a, this is a, you know, computer. This is a keyboard. This is a mouse. This, yeah. And, and then walking through, this is, you know, Facebook. This is, what they're yeah. um, really budget caches too, things like this Chromebook, I, I, I completely suggest for them. You can't screw it up. Yeah. It's a browser attached to a keyboard. What are they really going to use it for? They're not going to be loading Office on it. They're not going to be doing it. They're probably just what they want to get on Facebook. They want to read some news articles because the paper's pulling away. They want to watch some YouTube videos. I've actually found a lot of students like the YouTube a lot because uh, it's visual. If it's like watching TV, they type in a search, yeah. they can yeah. watch. Different things. How to dark, how to garden, how to, you know, all yeah. the little interesting like that. And there's, YouTube's be, they're really culturing it better to be tutorials and things like that. You know, the revenue sharing they do with people, you can make so much money on YouTube doing this, so which is great because now that YouTube's doing, they have such a good monetization process for people that encourages them to, to produce videos, you're getting better and better tutorial videos on YouTube. Yeah. You know, they're, uh, I don't know if you remember the revenue model, but it's basically you get a one-seventh cut of whatever the ad revenue is, they give you one-seventh of it. Mm -hmm. So you can make, I mean, there's already a lot of people who are YouTube millionaires. Really? Yeah. There's, uh, well, the gaming guys are still the king. The highest paid guy on YouTube is Pootie Pie. Uh, he does those stupid gaming videos my kids love. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. 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 Um, so that's, uh... he, they estimate he made it uh, five million last year. So you're talking about a guy who's 20 years old making five million dollars making gaming videos. Who said you can't make money sitting around playing video games all day? Well, and so there's been a lot of interesting, you know, not just well, YouTube, but you know, all kinds of video training things. I know Khan's Academy. Uh, what's that other one? Uh, anyway, so there's there's a lot of good stuff. And we we put on uh, for my business, we put all put more and more stuff on YouTube ourselves, explaining software tutorials. I just did one on LastPass. What I do is I did a blog post on LastPass and how to use it, and I did a uh, YouTube video that I do the voice and everything. And I thought this is how you do this, this is how you uh, load your vault up on LastPass and how you change the passwords and how it generates the passwords and how you can save things. So I started doing more tutorials myself because it's, it promotes our business, you know. So how do, people ask, how do I replace a screen? Because we have a retail store phone right here. We got a video on how you replace screens and laptops. How do you replace touch screens and laptops? We set up the cameras, we have tutorials that make them real concise and keep them under five minutes, and they show how the breakdown goes. And that's very helpful to people. I laugh because most people still won't do it themselves. 
But well, at least they, we haven't. We talk about repairing laptops. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm real comfortable with the desktop. I have. See, the problem for me is I can't remember where all these little tiny screws go, yeah, right? You know? That is a trick. <laughs> but I've seen some, you know, one of the guys in the club, he took apart my laptop, put it back together, and it still worked. And it's like, okay. wow. That's that's, we, we do it every day. Um, at least I, uh, we have a retail store, and you know we've got a lot of customers. We've got over 4,000 clients, and a big part of our everyday thing. So as you go to the website, first thing, one of the advertisements is, you know, screen repair. We stock a big variety of screens. People break their screens at an unbelievable rate. So every single day we're doing screen repairs without exception. Well, it's not an interesting topic. You know, take part in your laptop and put it back together. It's shocking how uh, so many of them, like this, this is a common design. There's no screws. So you literally get this apart by peeling the edges off and getting the tape off of it very carefully, working it around. That's some of the videos you do. because people start, they look at it and go, oh, there's no screws. How do I get this out? Yeah, yeah. And um, we charge, we make it really simple, we have a flat rate, it's 125 for the screen pair, it doesn't matter what screen it is, unless it's a touch screen, um, but then showing the tutorials on how to do it. Some people, like I said, they're ambitious and want to learn how to do it themselves, other people, they see it, they see what it takes to do it, so they go, I'd rather just pay you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. But that's part of it, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's still pretty, I, hardware tutorials, no problem doing that. Um, so, I'm trying, I'm probably going to do, because all the video editing, I do, everything I do, one of my uh, concepts when I started my company is I'm going to run everything on open source. So we custom wrote our own point of sale system because nothing existed to manage a store the way I wanted it to. So that's custom. I haven't open sourced that. I plan to. And the reason is some people like, oh, you didn't open source your point of sale system. I'm like, no, no, I actually plan to. The code is a disaster is the only reason I have it. There's no way for me to turn it into an open source project because it's not documented. Um, well, so much of it's not normalized, so much of it's not sanitized. We've sometimes coded the passwords to things inside the code instead of in a config file. Well, so that's <laughs> the type of thing that uh, in an open source project that people would step forward and try to help you with. Yes, I and mean, that's where I have a point of sale software, there are people who would probably jump in and help Yeah, them. and that's what I'm trying. I've uh, talked to a few people, I've not found anyone who will solidly commit to it. So um, maybe we could do a presentation on that, see if there's anyone in the you know, community that would be interested yeah. in coming forward and seeing a presentation. I mean, that's so what I thought about doing some of the larger rugs and find, find someone who's, because a lot of people jump in with open source projects and they go, that sounds fun, I want to jump into it. And you give them the code and they start working on it. I'm busy, I got this yeah, whole project to work. Sure, sure. But that's the problem with open source sometimes, you have to have someone who's really passionate and sees it. Um, this is such a niche project, it's a basic point of sale system and customer management system for a computer store. So you get this niche. The ideal is if I had a PHP programmer who also had a computer store so he can so he understands the the business and understands what the code. That's how I got to where it was. I had a coder looking for me. Um, well, there's something like generalizing the code so it can be used for the popsicle stand or right. that type of thing. It's well there's a lot there's so many good point sale systems for popsicle stands and for other businesses. There's certain aspects that are some more simplistic and works with the workflow. QuickBooks is awful for me, for especially the customer management side of it, um, to try and use it for my business. So that's part of the reason we roll our own for the way we manage things. It's service oriented for people bringing in, so the electronics repair, computer repair works great for. Uh, bringing people up to sell general items, no, it's not. It's, it's actually kind of bad at that. It doesn't need, we don't really sell general items. Our focus, we're a service company, not a sales company. So it's not. Okay. <clears throat> I know another guy who's written uh, some sort of uh, work tracking software for car dealerships, right? Very narrow niche. And yeah. He's having trouble finding customers to buy that. So, yeah, I can understand. Yeah, he's yeah he's competing with like Mitchell on Demand, which is pretty much the big software for all the vehicle repair companies. All my uh, customers that we have that are in the auto shop business, every one of them has Mitchell on Demand. There's just they said there's nothing else that comes close to it for uh, for completeness and everything else. You know, it's like the product. Yeah. So, like I said, it can be kind of tough with some of them trying to when you have a niche item and then open sourcing it makes it that much more because you got to look. In my plan isn't at all to monetize on it. It's just to turn it over to the community. So I would reap the benefits of having a better code base as people add features that I want to add. If you want features, I want to add. 
then I just don't have time to code myself. I'm not the best coder. I'm kind of a hack at it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm busy running a business, but I don't always have time to sit down and pour the hours into coding and doing so many other things. Right. Yeah. But, you know, when it comes to the open source world, I've been working with open source even when I used to be a corporate IT director. We did open source projects. I uh, ran them back into the company that I was IT director for. Um, I run my business, everything's Linux servers in the back. Well, there's got to be a lot of folks around town here that are interested in that too, you know? Oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> I don't know, you know I, I haven't plugged in with them. We talk a lot, like, you know, with Mug and stuff like that. I'm sure some of them are yeah. you know, very deeply involved in that. You know? I haven't, you know, all the times I've seen presentations, we've talked about, you know, various things like various projects that are using open source. We've talked about, you know, some of the tools like GitHub, GitHub and stuff like that. But I don't know anybody's really sat down and just walked us through, you know, open source project management and how this really, you know, works. Yeah, yeah it comes to that. Right. There was a, I, so I went to, yesterday morning at 9 a.m., there was a panel on getting a job in open source. And it was, it was interesting. The guy, the three gentlemen there were for Oakland County. Um, I kind of wish my Wayne County friends would have been up, um, told, would, they would have, could have spoke to it too. But I brought up examples that they were talking about how to get things like, you know, the resumes, uh, what builds your resume to become a, a programmer right now, is having open source projects under your belt are great. And listing, the first thing you should list on your resume is your GitHub account or projects. Um, Joe, who worked for me, brilliant programmer. Joe's experience is he worked for Jimmy John's, young guy. Works for me. This is his next job. The second job he's had is doing this. Joe gave me the most basic, I can fix computers resume, but I need the interview well. I liked him, so I hired him. I come to find out he's even have his website listed. I find his website. He's got his programming projects. So you can program in PHP, Java, C, C Sharp, all this. Yep. Yeah. And I'm like, they're like 22 at the time, and 21. Yeah, I think he just turned 21. And uh, <clears throat> he worked for me for three years. But the guy's programming skills were brilliant. He, he coded way better than the previous person I had done. So he really advanced my own sales system with yeah. all kinds of function coding. Then he started writing more scripts that we use at our store, uh, started writing in Python. He knows so many languages, it blew my mind. No college degree or anything. Yeah. And uh, then from there, his he kept updating. Um, there's a lot of dead time when you're doing PC repair. You know, you're loading Windows. We have an imaging server and things like that, so we concurrently image a lot of machines when people bring them in. But that's next. Wait 20 minutes before the image is done. Wait 20 minutes for that one. 20 minutes for that one. In his meantime, he'd be sitting there coding away. He wrote some games. He participated in some online projects. He wrote some. Uh, he actually wrote some code that got updated in Wikipedia that he submitted to, for some type of bug fix that ended up in our main code base. The guy had was. Just that's his free time, and then even after work, that's what he was doing at home. So a head on company, they don't hire people, they don't put ads out. I can't remember the company he worked for off the top of my head. Um, but they basically look for people who have the skills. They could care less what your degree is. Yeah. And that got that landed him the job there. They bugged him a couple times, but he was a creature of habit. He says, Well, you know, I, I couldn't pay him the 80 grand a year they pay him, but they kept offering him, and he told me, he's like, Tom, I got, I got to tell you something. <laughs> I got this company bugging me, and I'm like, what do you mean, bugging you? And he's like, well, they really want me to work there. I'm like, dude, I said, I know I, you're a great computer tech, but this is not what you do. You're a brilliant programmer, and I don't have work for you to pay you for your skills. I said, I gave him a couple days off. I said, go interview. There are interviews where they sit you down in front of the computer, they got problems, solve the problems, write the code from scratch. And if you can't do it, you can just go home. Yeah. That was their interview process. Passed with flying covers. And, but that's what landed him the job was having his whole resume updated with the GitHub thing and everything. It's just... Yeah, well, so I, you know, I, I'm hearing a lot of these things about, and it's scary to me. You know, I go into an interview and I say, well, you have these you know, five requirements or something like that. And isn't it always the case that you, know, you, you can do three, four? You know, so they're usually one that is kind of like out there you can't possibly get to. So I, I can't imagine an, an interview where you're actually, you know, required to create the, you know, the code and make it all work. And that, that was what's great about it because people can lie on resumes. Yeah. And people can go through college and, I, I, you know, I, I refer them, especially in my field of IT, I call them paper chasers. They're really good at reading a book and regurgitating answers oh, yeah. and passing tests. Oh, yeah. They have no conceptual skill of how things work. Yeah. Um, I've got a guy with a degree that works for me with some uh, certs. I have a guy with zero certs. The guy with zero certs has nothing to do with it. Uh, you know, the fact that he didn't get a cert. He's brilliant because he's got a passion for it. Joe didn't finish college and is making 
really good money, has a great career path. He's now programming for Fortune 100 companies is where they contract him out to. And he's got this great job at 24 years old with no college degree. You know, he's gone through some schooling, but he kept dropping out of classes, failed them. He just didn't want to go. He's, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny because he'd be like all night he worked on writing his game and then skipped his entire day of classes, you know, because he wanted to finish his game and finish the code for it. You know, so that passion he had for it, but that's what drives some of these people. They had a panel on people working in IT and a couple of people up there, they, they're, one guy's a high school dropout, kind of like I am. I got no college degree either. It's just, I've been in tech. I got out of high school, hated it went right into a tech job, loved it, and that's all I've done now for 28 years is just work in tech. You know, then I started my business and everything else, but it's because you get a passion for it, you just, I can't put it down, I'm hacking stuff, soldering stuff together, that's, you know, it's, uh, it's all about having a passion for it to really get there, but like GitHub and some of those tools, you get a job by building your resume, by showing your skills, not by showing that, and that's what some of these tech companies are really looking for for people, they want to see people passionate stuff. Zuckerberg built Facebook because of his passion for the way he wanted to connect things and he's a brilliant coder. He came up with a lot of really cool stuff and that's what built Facebook, that's what built Google. You know, all these ideas and absolute unstoppable passion for him. Bill Gates, all those guys. It's not their college degrees that got them where they are. <laughs> but, oh sorry, I got a little off topic. No, no. <laughs> uh, so somehow we got to wrangle these people in that are compassionate about this. I, mean, I can't. I can't understand. I have a, a computer club meeting that gets together. We get ten people attending. When there's got to be a hundred guys that really be interested in sitting and talking about something, you know? Yeah, connecting with them. Um, I don't know. Probably a lot of social media marketing. The problem I'm starting to run into now. When I uh, we were talking about with the lug, like the uh, with the Wayne State lug, majority of those guys hate Facebook, so they're not. Yeah. How do you connect with them? Yeah. They don't really want emails. They don't. You get just. Randomly, I want to find all the people with this interest and get all their email addresses. It makes it really, really tough. The plan we came up with, we talked to a guy from Oregon State. We, we sent an IRC all day at work, so I got one screen dedicated to the IRC channel. But a guy from Oregon, Oregon State, they have like 100 people that show up at their Olympic users group. Who am I dude, you got to tell us. How'd you get 100 people on your regular attendees? And he said, well, he goes, what we did, because he's at the university, um, we went through and talked to every science professor. And we let everyone in there know. We pick the topic that we're going to cover. They go and they, each professor hands this out and also participates and also sometimes those class points at this. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, I'll give you uh, some type of class point or whatever if you guys all go. So you've got a huge number of computer science students and they're all being uh, asked to come to this. And they do the same thing at the Walsh College, uh, Nan, sorry, I don't remember that, so Nan something. Um, she's She's one of the people that run the, um, on there, she's also a professor at Walsh College and she'll suggest that some of the students come in there when, you know, when we do the talk and it was kind of cool to see that many people show up because now you're encouraging it. And of course some of them, they, they, it's like in the interrupt, I don't want to go to hear some guy talk and do a boring, he's going to have a PowerPoint and it's not going to be, you know, someone come in with that attitude but then they watch it and it, I try to make everything engaging with some q and A. I I do live demos and not just a boring PowerPoint slide. And they, well, that's cool, and then they email you, hey, let's uh, talk about this, talk about this, not even engage them, and they're going to show up again on their own without a class break. Well, that gets back to your idea, you know, bring the gadgets in, right? Bring so the gadgets in. Rather than just sitting there looking at some person with a screen and yes. you know, getting to the point where, and there was a, actually a group uh, at PangoCon that was working on the, uh, um, I think it was the registration software, right? They got together, you had like a dozen people come in, and they were all coding. You know, mm -hmm. coding on this one project. You know? Okay, that's kind of interesting approach to this. Uh, I don't know how I would you know, leverage that again. You have to have a product together. You have to right. get it out the door and that type of thing. I thought they were. They had a. They they had a panel yesterday on uh, how to do full disk encryption on Windows or Linux. And the girl giving a talk, very knowledgeable. She works in security. Uh, the problem. It's, I've already done all this, so I, I just want to see what the class was like and see how the panel was going to go. Uh, sometimes the problem in what she had, she's really smart, but she kept driving off topic. Three different times, and as my wife came in and she's like, wow, she's back on talking about our kids. Yeah. And like for 10 minutes about how her kid did this or kid did that. And like, ah, you're so, if people are waiting, you know, like, oh, what's the next command to get TrueCrypt set up? Yeah. And that's 
part of it, having the good speakers helps too, but bringing a gadget and hands on workshops are great. So when we get to keep it on topic, I try to pull a point in and bring them on in. As if not, someone's going to pull up YouTube, hey, watch this video. No, I'm sorry, that's, that's not today's topic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so good moderation helps too uh, when you do have all the gadgets, but get the gadgets out in front of them, do some hands on workshops, how to do this. I'm definitely, um, I've thought about doing a little workshop. You know, it depends on how much time you have. But really break down last pass as a password manager. Yeah. Well, so if you want to do like a presentation, you know, tell me when, how, all that stuff. I okay. Can, I can make that happen. Uh, so. Sure. Yeah. I already email. Just you have email, and we'll, we'll come up with a time and date. And yeah. I generally I'm pretty flexible on times when I can get things done. So. Well, I can set a date right now. <laughs> <laughs> I got my camera.